This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 242. Recorded on May 13th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. Looking forward to our afternoon together. An afternoon. And from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Hello there. It's 11 o'clock in the morning, my time. I'm on the West Coast. And from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. How's things? We span the coast. We expand the country, right? Yeah. East Coast, Michigan, the South. Are you the South, Michael? Is that fair? I am. I am in the Southeast. Yes. And, and I would uh, like to be. I'm from the North Coast, the Great Lakes <laughs> state. Hey. Is there a coast? Is there North a coast? coast? Yeah, we've got all the Great Lakes. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Do you ever uh, swim in the lakes, Michelle? Um, I do. Yeah, it's chilly. But Now, your little cabin you have, is that on one of the lakes or no? It is walking distance to uh, Lake Michigan. Ooh. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Nice. Yeah. Well, I'm here in New York City where uh, there are a lot of buildings. <laughs> <laughs> and water. My, and there's water. My Right outside my window here uh, in my office at Columbia, there's the Hudson River. Which goes what? up and down the Hudson River. Have you heard of that, Alio? The Hudson River? I sure have. <laughs> goes up the George and down. Washington and Bridge is right out George the Washington Bridge. I yep. see it right out the window. And Michelle, you were here at one time. I have so fond you... memories of those years, Vincent. Yeah. So uh, boats go up and down the river, airplanes. There's an Air Force base up there. So a lot of activity here. And today on TWIM, we have a lot of microbial activity. We have for you a snippet and a paper and I have to say, let me do this snippet um, for you. This was actually an eLife paper picked by Rich Condit on TWIV a few weeks ago as a pick of the week. And I said, we have to do this on TWIM. And the name is The Diversity and Function of Sourdough Starter Microbiomes. Oh, boy. I'm hungry already. Me, yes, Topical. it makes me hungry, too. Now, now Condit I love oh, Condit owes us either a loaf of bread or cinnamon rolls, one or the other. I love sourdough bread. It's so, so tasty and so different. Let's mm. figure out why. What makes it so tasty? Good, good question. And so this comes from uh, uh, groups at Tufts University, although All right. not where you were, Alio. This is in Medford, which is uh, outside of Boston. University of Colorado, North Carolina State. North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and the University of Copenhagen. Say Copenhagen, please. You don't like Copenhagen? No, that's German. In Danish, <laughs> it's called Copenhagen. <laughs> Copenhagen. All right. Copenhagen is the way uh, Americans or English should people. say it. Should say it. Okay. I'm always trying to be sophisticated, but I guess I'm wrong most of the time. <laughs> anyway, the uh, let's see. We have a couple of co-first authors, Elizabeth Landis and Angela Oliverio, Oliverio, and the last author is Benjamin Wolf. Now, everyone probably has heard of sourdough bread. It's a fermented food, of course, made using a mixture of yeasts and bacteria. And when you want to make sourdough bread, you get a starter and you inoculate the dough. And this starter has yeast, it has lactic acid bacteria, and acetic acid bacteria. And these all make carbon dioxide that makes the bread rise and also give it, you know, these bacteria and yeast make acids and enzymes, and it gives it flavor, texture, stability, and nutrition. And you could get a starter from your grandmother, right? (laughs) Or your friend could give you a starter, or you could make it. Uh, de novo, as they say here. Uh, but this is an old custom to make sourdough bread. Um, it's an old ma- custom. 
But as the yeah. authors point out, it experienced a cultural resurgence <laughs> during the COVID pandemic. So now many That's of right. your colleagues uh, may be able to give you their some of their sourdough starter. Did you make uh, any sourdough, Michelle? I did, and I'm actually getting some starter from a colleague, um, a microbiome scientist, Vince Young, is going to share wow. some of his starter with me tomorrow. Oh, that's cool. Well, um, yeah, a lot of people have been baking bread during co- bake cooking completely, but baking bread is a lot of fun. And bread and, is and just by the great. way. The, the author didn't just make that statement and leave it. They have a citation in another yeah. peer-reviewed journal article to back it up. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I like bread second to pasta. Right. <laughs> See, the problem is that I, bravo, I don't. Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I try not to eat a lot of carbs. Right. Not not a good thing. But they're tasty. So if I had a choice between pasta and bread, I'd pick the pasta. But boy, sourdough is just great. Anyway, so what's this paper about? So what what makes up this starter? And nobody's really. As they say, a comprehensive survey of sourdough starter communities has not been conducted. Now, there have been a few studies here and there uh, that uh, they do, they have done, and they say, but many of these were based on culturing the microbes. You know, this is not always accurate. And uh, so it doesn't give you the right answer. Plus, people maintain starters in their households, as you heard from Michelle, her colleague's going to give her a starter. And they may be different from the ones you might find in a commercial bakery. Uh, so they wanted to re-examine that, and they a main, you know, they say there are two main factors that have been suggested to drive the diversity of sourdough, and that's the geographic location, wherever you are, and uh, how this how the starter is maintained. And everyone's heard about the famous San Francisco sourdough bread, right? Which they say you can't get anywhere else. Well, <laughs> turns out you probably can. <laughs> as we will see. And the cool thing about this paper is if you look at their first figure, they show you how many starters they actually evaluated. And the number (laughs) is phenomenal. Really impressive. 500 and you have a map of the world and you see a dot everywhere except I don't think I saw a dot in Antarctica. But I saw a dot everywhere else. Well, there's none in South America, man. There are down in Chile, down are in the sure bottom. Those are dots. Those are dots. They don't look like dots to me. I, I blew it up because I'm I'm mm. going bat blind, and there are dots down there. I okay. think I didn't think so. I think there are none in South America. There none. There's one in Africa. I think looks like China and and uh, Russia. And much of Asia doesn't have much. There seems to be one in near Vietnam, Cambodia. One in Thailand. Thailand. But a bunch there in were, Europe. That looks like there's three in New Zealand and a whole bunch on the, um, I guess that's the east coast of Australia. As right. opposed to the west coast of Australia. But the bulk of them, 429 from the United States. Yeah, and and... So I have 500 in all. And um, th- this is figure, by the way, is, this is eLife, so it's open access. They have a picture of dough and bread. Oh, if you want to see a picture of bread. Elio is going to get hungry. I have at least eaten I'm, lunch. You bet. <laughs> yeah. Well, Elio, after this, you can have lunch and uh, have some bread. But uh, so they wanted to look at this and, and say, what are the factors? So they collect these samples, as you say, and most of them from the U.S., they have different ages. The starters have different ages. They have different maintenance history. Uh, and they use both cultivation dependent. They grow microbes, as you'll see, in, the, in cultivation independent sequence analysis to uh, look at the communities uh, and what's going on here. First, this is the first large scale survey of uh, starter microbial activity. And it reminded me of the paper we did a while ago about. Um, wine, Michael, right? Where they try yeah. to say, what makes a good wine? <laughs> the, the fancy French word I can never say properly, the terroir. Terroir, yeah. And there you have it, wine and bread. That's all you need, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so cheese. They, Maybe cheese too. Cheese would be good too. 
so they collected these uh, these different starters, and they do ribosomal RNA sequencing. Remember, these were all shipped to them. <laughs> they do the gene sequencing, and they find that each starter sample has a median of seven bacterial and 35 fungal sequence variants. And remember, they have yeasts, lactic acid bacillus uh, bacteria, and acetic acid bacteria. Um, and so the one order of lactic acid bacteria and uh, one order of acetic acid bacteria comprise over 97% of the bacterial reads. And for yeasts, uh, one order comprises over 70% of the fungal reads. And then they got other stuff too. They got other sequences, uh, common indoor and outdoor molds, you know, plant pathogens, skin microbes. And they said these are environmental contaminants that they got rid of, right? You, you need the dough yeah. <laughs> to, get, to get your bacteria in it. So Some of your skin got, comes off. <laughs> sure. And so they got rid of those. Um, and what do they find? So first, sourdough communities. What a great name. Would you like to live in a sourdough community? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Some days it feels like I do. <laughs> <laughs> they exhibited consistent patterns of strong species dominance or cur currents. So st- dominated, dominated by certain species. Uh, and they say many communities were dominated by a single yeast and or bacterial species with an average of three lactic acid and acetic acid bacteria and one yeast per starter. Um, so it's, you know, relatively simple. And one of the things that Michael and I were talking about before is they probably should just start throwing together, you know, three combinations and see if they can make good bread with that. That'd probably be quite interesting. Yeah, that that was one of the questions I had. If if you go to Lactobacillus San Franciscans, which is the predominant strain associated with the classical sourdough from San Francisco, yeah. you, you wonder if you can bias the selection. That was one of their key indicators of Uh, how the starter was progressing and the older age starters had a greater predominance up, if that's the right word Mm. for having lactobacillus San Franciscans in it. They also find that uh, they see variable abundance of acetic acid bacteria among all these starters. And they say, you know, these have been reported, but they're, they're understudied because they require special culture conditions to propagate them and they haven't been studied very much. So this is really the first time that they're being looked at and they, you know, they're, they're in, in, in their samples, 147 starters had over 1% uh, acetic acid bacterial species. And, and uh, they can and make that's some of what the, gives the flavor. That's yeah. what gives the flavor. Yeah. And it, it will come to flavors in a moment. <laughs> you get even more hungry. Yes. <laughs> All right. Geography. What about other factors? Geog- geography. Is it is the composition of the community correlated with geography? Um, and basically, no. There's small differences across the U.S. and, and overseas. But um, they say the yeast taxonomic composition was weakly pre- predicted by uh, geography. And the same uh, with bacteria, which is quite interesting, right? That they're more or less similar over long distances. I mean, they say certainly certain certain taxa are enriched in parts of the U.S., but the, you know, the signal is weak, so it's not clear that that means anything. Um, and other things they looked at to see if they made a difference, the age of the starter, the storage location, feed frequency, grain input, home characteristics, climate factors, they account for less than 10% of the variation in the community composition. So none of that seems to matter very much. Um, and maybe and you other, mentioned this this other variable was how often the um, owner of the starter fed the culture. So you're supposed right. to replenish it with some more flour every so often. Yes. And they've got Fe- that feed. plotted as a bar graph. How yes. many feeds per month? <laughs> Did a lot you, of detail. Are, are you going to get all of these data from Vince when he shares with you his starter? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I just I just care about outcome. Oh, you just you're, you're an outcome lady. You yeah, bet. She wants yeah. the bread. 
Are you gonna are you gonna eat it, right, Michelle? Well, no, I'm, you have to use it to start your loaf. So. You, no, no, you're gonna eat the bread that you make. Oh, though, right? absolutely. You're not gonna give it all away. I'm not gonna <laughs> give any of it away. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. Uh, also, I'm, I'm the not, I'm not coming. I'm not coming. <laughs> You're not coming. <laughs> uh, then the history and the origin. So they looked at that whether it was made de novo or established. Um, so one lactic acid bacteria, L. brevis, was associated with de novo starters. Seventy-three starters in the collection were originally acquired by home bakers from a bakery or other commercial source, and L. San Franciscensis was abundant in these commercial starters. Uh, and they think that maybe that particular uh, species thrives under commercial production conditions, which are different from home production, right? And so maybe they persist. Um, and then uh, uh, they looked at some some growth. Uh, they did some growth experiments to see if growth rate or interactions among the microbes could uh, help to explain some of these species distributions. So they picked I- eight isolates for lactic acid bacteria for yeasts. These are the most frequent ones. And they uh, they grew them. They did they grew them in broths and they did 48 hour transfers from broth to broth. And they also did competition between pairs of uh, these species. Uh, and and most of these grew fine with alone or with somebody else <laughs> in the culture. And some of them did not. Um, in particular. So uh, this is something they say needs more expansion, but you know, the obviously there are community things, interactions going on here. And, yeah. One, um, one that I thought was particularly curious is they found a negative pattern of co-occurrence between yeah. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is kind of a workhorse and Lactobacillus San Franciscans, yeah. which I would have, I would have thought that they would be friends by now. But. <laughs> yeah. You would think, you would think. So I think, you know, the next experiment is to make concoctions and then make bread and see how it tastes. Right? <laughs> that would be a lot of fun. I would like to volunteer for that. Yeah, I would too. Uh, and then finally, dough rise and aroma profile. So they make dough and they they can measure how it rises. There's actually a movie in the in the paper. Oh, the movie it. is great. The movie is great. You it, you have to look at the movie. Making take a movie of the dough rising and all these tubes. Um, so they look at 40 starters that span the diversity. They, so they measure emission of volatile organic compounds, which can help make the aromas and the taste even, and then the leavening, the rise of the bread. And the, it's funny, the volatiles are measured by GC mass spec. Yeah, I mean, right? this is quantitative, high-tech stuff they're yeah. doing. They're not, it's not just subjective. 123 volatiles were detected, and you may recognize 3-methyl-1-butanol, ethyl alcohol, acetic acid, of course, ethyl acetate. And they say sensory analysis yielded 14 dominant notes. Oh, I love it. They (laughs) smelled it. (laughs) And they have yeasty, vinegar, acetic acid, acetic sour, uh, green apple, (laughs) fermented sour, and ethyl acetate solvent tea. All the range of different uh, smells and tastes. It's just great. And they say the source of the starter explains most of the variation in the in the organic uh, dissimilarities. And um, also the differences in the dough height was also explained by the source of the starter as well. The height and how fast the dough uh, rises. So, again, not surprising that the, the, what you start with influences what something tastes and smells like uh, as well. Um, and I, I love bet these notes. You, I bet Go you ahead, if Mike. we did this with home brew, uh, where people are brewing their own beers and they're trying to develop flavor profiles, uh, you'll, you'll get a similar figure to figure four. And again, since this is open access, you can see what I mean by this, where they list out all of the chemicals that the GCMS is able to detect and the relative abundance of the VOCs, which adds to that flavor profile of the the sourdough, giving it that distinctive taste as well as texture because some of these compounds will have an effect on the gluten. As you go through the kneading process, it can change the texture 
of the gluten, giving it that all important chew factor that we yep. often associate yep. with sourdough bread, as opposed to uh, what many of us grew up on is Wonder Bread or some of these other commercial baked products. But also the marvelous crust. Oh, the crust. crust. Yeah. Oh, the crust. <laughs> that has a lot to do with the oven and the humidity in the oven, but anyway. Yes. Yeah. And by the way, la- final thing, the, this, these volatiles they seem to be driven by the acetic acid bacteria largely. So the volatiles, the sensory notes, mostly the acetic acid bacteria. So they say the variation in acetic acid bacteria abundance is a key driver of the functional diversity go- across all these collections. So. Those acetic acid bacteria are really important, and they've been understudied up until now. Right, Mm -hmm. right. Owing to the fact that we don't have a lot of on-the-shelf media to in order to characterize the acetic acid bacteria. And they point that out in their discussion. That's part of the problem. So that's the story, basically. We and they say, you know, maybe we can we can manage uh, these starters better. and it shows that, you know, the idea of San Francisco sourdough is not all about geography. It's just where these starter cultures uh, end up because they're all pretty oh, similar. I got a question for you, Vincent. Yeah. yeah. How many microbiomes are there left to be studied? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I think there are a lot. Yeah. There's going to be papers like this galore, aren't there? Oh, yeah, it'd be plenty. But this one is particularly fun because uh, I like bread, right? <laughs> I haven't Let's seen see. a paper studying the microbiome of the inside of our shoes. Ooh, well, that, would, that would be uh, – <laughs> No, thank you. So no, we thank got, you, Michelle. So, the, Alio, the interesting ones to me are wine, cheese, bread, and maybe beer, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe um, kimchi. Yeah, so other cultures have different foods that they're yep. interested in, but – Yogurt. You know, yogurt would be another one, yeah. Mm-hmm. But I mean, yeah, this was just fun. So I thought you would enjoy it. It was fun. What we need to do is get Rich Condit to send you, to send Michelle some of his starter and Michelle make two loaves of bread and do the taste test and then determine if Condit's starter was better than Vince Young's starter. Where did Vince Young get his starter, Michelle? Do you know? Um, I'll ask, but I know that he, he, posts his pictures of bread on Twitter. So I know that he's been baking um, during the pandemic. Can I, I presume you can buy a starter, right? Is that correct? I don't know if you can. No? But I, I'll post a picture. He sent me a photo of, of the starter that he's going to be very proud to share. I'll, I'll post it on the show notes. This work, by the way, was funded by the National Science Foundation. Yeah. Oh, this is funny. It says, I looked it up. If you're antisocial, you can buy a sourdough, sourdough starter. Isn't that funny? Oh, is that right? Because <laughs> <laughs> you won't get it from your friend. Uh, all right. Uh, Elio, you have a paper for us. I have a paper. The paper is entitled Discovery and Characterization of a Novel Family of Prokaryotic Nanocompartments Involved in Sulfur Metabolism. The emphasis is on nanocompartments. And the authors are Nichols, LaFrance, Phillips, Radford, Oltroge, Valentin Alvarado, Bischoff, Nogales, and Savage. And they're all from Berkeley except for one person who's from the University of Toronto. So what this is about is, um, we're changing subjects completely, by the way. I think this has very little to do with anything edible. (laughs) That is true. So I'm going to start out by generalization, namely that one of the great classical distinctions between prokaryotes and eukaryotes has been that eukaryotes have organelles, okay? And prokaryotes supposedly don't have organelles. Well, this distinction is going by the wayside because prokaryotes turn out to have things that look like organelles, they're called micro compartments, nano compartments, and capsulins, and other names. And while the, although these are not as sophisticated as the organelles of eukaryotes, such as mitochondria and chloroplasts, they are distinct spaces, distinct uh, places inside of the bacteria and archaea, which have uh, Apparently, apparently, the role 
of compartmentalizing enzymes which would work better if they are in a narrow space uh, for all kinds of reasons and also to keep toxic components in isolation. So they may be unpretentious. They're, they're protein bags, by the way. They do not have lipids. They may be unpretentious, but they are something that can be uh, legitimately be called organelles. So we're going to call them organelles here, yeah, okay? Or micro compartments, if you wish. And they're involved in a whole lot of activities, from photosynthesis to certain possibly role in disease, because they're found in pathogens as well, like tubercle bacilli. So we have a new category of structures in the microbial world, in the bacterial and eukaryotic in the prokaryotic world, and they are they're interesting. Now, the classical organelle, the, the one that's been studied the most and the longest, is one that's called carboxysomes. Carboxysomes are uh, found in uh, cyanobacteria, the main photosynthetic bacteria, and uh, they're even found in plant chloroplasts, which tells you something about their possible origins. Anyhow, carboxysomes store Rubisco. That's the enzyme that carries out carbon dioxide fixation during photosynthesis. Uh, so Rubisco is not floating around in the cytoplasm of uh, photosynthetic bacteria. It's enca- encapsulated, if you wish, in a nano compartment, a carboxysome. Uh, the carboxysomes also increase the local CO2 concentration by using what's called a CO2 concentrating mechanism. And, uh, they encapsulate the enzyme carbonic and hydrase, which supplies CO2 from a cytoplasm pool of bicarbonate. Uh, not only that, carboxysomes sequester toxic aldehyde intermediates and remove them from the cytoplasm. So um, they are found mainly in um, uh, the cyanobacteria, but they're also found in proteobacteria. And the shells are not all identical. The protein shell of carboxysomes are not all identical. They come in several distinct forms. Now, an interesting point that was that, that caught my eye is that carboxysomes present an opportunity for possibly spectacular improvement in crop crop production. Imagine cloning carboxysomes or their uh, carbon concentrating mechanism from cyanobacteria into plant chloroplasts. This might increase the level of photosynthesis in crops and augment production. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, it's been studied in a number of labs, and uh, maybe maybe it will work. And, Cloning carboxysomes into chloroplasts is not a simple thing. So they're not, uh, organ- prokaryotic organelles are not limited to carboxysomes. In fact, in this paper today, we're going to talk about a novel kind. There's an abundance of that. They're found in, no, known to be found in 19 bacterial phyla. However, I don't think that's a very impressive number because the number of bacterial phyla is supposed to be in the, in the thousands. But anyhow, they're not uncommon. And they are involved in all kinds of things. The propane diol metabolism, whatever that is, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I don't you remember your that. mixed acid fermentations? It's one of I the I don't remember end it as I should. But anyhow, these um, their bacterial organelles are involved in propane diol metabolism. Now, an even smaller uh, kind of compartments are called encapsulins, which are simpler, even simpler. They consist of just two proteins, one that self-assembles into an icosahedral shell, shell, which looks a lot like a viral capsid, and a cargo protein, that is the protein which is carried by the, by the organelle, which is often multifunctional. Um, what is interesting is the cargo proteins have a peptide sequence that allows their encapsulation. Isn't that nice? They are not only cargo, but they make sure they're cargo. And it's beautiful <laughs> that the cargo and the capsid protein are encoded next to one another. 
That's right. They're so it's a little right. unit that can, yeah. Isn't that funny? It's beautiful. And so the the uh, this is really great stuff. I mean, and it, it changes a little bit one's view of the simplicity of the bacterial and archaeal cytoplasm. It ain't all that simple. It's got complications, and they're, they're interesting. Now, the paper that I'm going to discuss, and remember it had to do with sulfur metabolism. Indeed, uh, it is a new nanocompartment, which is found in the cyanobacterium Sinecococcus elegantus, and is involved in sulfur metabolism. How do we know? Well, this it is upregulated during sulfur starvation. And the only cargo enzyme it has is an enzyme called cysteine desulfurase, which I mm-hmm. doubt that everybody knows what it is, so I'll tell you. It removes the sulfur from cysteine and converts cysteine into alanine. That's all it does. And what role this has in sulfur metabolism, I can't really tell you much about, but it has a role in sulfur metabolism. So what these authors did in, in great style is to study in detail the structure, structural feature, features of this encapsulin, the sulfur involved in capsulin. And they did this in a variety of ways. They really study the, the biochemistry of this in detail. But most of what they did, which is interesting, is comes from cryo-electron microscopy. Uh, as, as you know, one of the modern and exciting tools we have for studying what, what, what's where and what, how does it work. Now, the shell, the protein shell that uh, is featured in, is, is, has features in common with capsid proteins of phages, namely the tail phages, the caudovirales, which are the most common phages around. They're the ones with tails, and they, they're capsid, and the, and the shell of these organelles have things in common. Maybe they have a common ancestry. Uh, and uh, the exciting thing is that the homologues of the shell protein are found in virus mycobacteria, including human TB and avian TB pathogens. So this is a detailed structural study. Uh, I won't go into much more detail because you can read about it, and it's, uh, it just says that uh, it suggests that one can study these things. That's sort of the message. You can, if you have. And I'll add the other um, take home point is they saw from the structure that it was quite different from the other encapsulins that had been well studied. Right. So they discovered a new family, family mm. two, that has a different structure, which they That's could right. um, deduce from looking at the, their um, sophisticated single particle uh, electron microscopy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's, mm-hmm. Michelle. That's a good point. Anyhow, the, the point here is that you can study these things. And um, this will provide the further studies, which I'm sure are going to follow this, this one, will provide further insights into the divergence and origins of prokaryotic nanocompartments. So we can expect many, many more discoveries because these things are going to be very common, not only, I'll repeat, not only in the cyanobacteria, but also in more ordinary garden variety bacteria, including pathogens. Now, what they're doing in the pathogens, we don't know yet, but you, you can be sure that it's going to be studied. So that's uh, about it. It's a, it's a paper which is enormously detailed in, in structural. The, the structural aspects of it are really exciting. And uh, I, I commend this paper to all of you to read it. And And Elio, to expand on your point that we're going to hear a lot more about these encapsulins, they actually um, cited a bioinformatics study that was um, done by one of the authors 
whose name is Devin Radford. So he is the person from University of Toronto. And his um, PhD thesis was a bioinformatic analysis that looked computationally in all the genome sequences for these phage-like proteins that were unlikely to be part of phage, but they could deduce that they were instead likely to be part of the structural component of these encapsulins. So this new family that they found is even larger than the previously described family. So there are a lot of these little two-component um, tiny organelles, proteinaceous organelles in uh, microbial cells, making their metabolism much more efficient. So let me ask you all this question. Did the phage steal encapsulins Ooh. to make phage capsids? Mm -hmm. Or was it the phage who brought the capsid structure, because even when you look at the th thing that Elio introduced us to, the carboxysome, it looks like that enzymatic machinery that fixes CO2 is actually encased in a phage head. When you look at the structure on Wikipedia for a carboxysome, it looks like a phage head. Hmm. And when I was reading this, it reminded me of what is actually going on here chemically. These are often redox-based exchanges that are going on, which are very challenging biochemically. If you've ever done organic chemistry on the bench, you know how challenging uh, dramatic redox jumps are. And if you think about it, for the carboxysome, you're going where the carbon is oxidized at plus four and you're taking that carbon all the way down to minus four in one fell swoop. And they talk a little bit about the importance of redox chemistry in the encapsulins. And I think what we're getting the first glimpses of is how the prokaryotes are such a remarkable entity being able to do this very sophisticated chemistry in these very small volumes that any sane organic chemist would tell you is absolutely insane. It, it's not possible. <laughs> Yet the microbes are able to do it. And I think the encapsulins, you know, starting from the fact that the microbe makes certain that they're they're coincident with one another on the same operon. It's like going to the store and buying tonic and not certain if you have enough gin in the house. You want to make certain <laughs> that you have enough gin and tonic and then limes because otherwise the drink is no good. And so consequently that in in the carboxysome that Elio introduced us to is the one that I often associated with because in addition to Rubisco, it's got the carbonic anhydrase, which really drives home the importance of having that stoichiometric balance. And I think that's what's really coming through. And the authors do us great justice to, to laying this out for the reader by telling us in their last paragraph the evolutionary origins of encapsulins and the prospect of additional undiscovered families. They also did a series of really um, powerful experiments where they could show that they can not only purify these encapsulins, but they can also um, get them to encapsulate in vitro. So that mm -hmm. opened up a lot of um, opportunity for experiments. And what they found is that the enzyme that is the cargo is much more um, active when it is encapsulated than when it's mm -hmm. in solution. Mm -hmm. So then they speculate about why that could be. Is it an allosteric change that um, occurs that makes the enzyme more active? Or are there other benefits for it being encapsulated? Is it because you've got to protect the enzyme from the reducing environment of the cytosol? Or rather, hmm. do you have to protect the cytosol from this enzyme that could go and... <laughs> wreak and, havoc. Uh, yeah, wreak havoc in the cytosol. And of course, those possibilities aren't mutually exclusive. It could be that each of those is a, is a benefit of the encapsulation. Yeah. But I just... I just found it so elegant and beautiful um, in its simplicity, minimalism. Yeah. 
Michael, you didn't you didn't answer your question. Did the virus or the cell come first? And um, yeah, what's your thought on that, Vincent? My my thought is that the bacteria invented in capsulins and the phage stole it. Uh-huh. I think that that's like <laughs> microbe centric with um, with a lot of uh, eukaryotic viruses. The capsid protein seems to have originated uh, in cells, right? But you know, prokaryotes are much older, so. And and Kunin, Eugene Kunin and Mar- Mark Krupovich, who have written a lot about this, basically say it could have happened either way. You yeah. can't tell, and it could have gone back and forth over evolutionary time. But it, it's it's just striking. They look like phage heads, right? Oh, they do. <laughs> they do. So this work was done by two graduate students at Berkeley, and they were um, co-author, co-first authors. Um, Robert Nichols is um, hails from the Pocono Mountain region of northeastern Pennsylvania, and he got first mm-hmm. excited about science um, by his high school teacher, Paul Nail, um, who taught really sophisticated, advanced microbiology, con- molecular biology concepts, but he made them accessible to high schoolers. So he then uh, went on and majored in biochemistry at Ithaca College, and he was able to do uh, research with um, Maki Inada, where he was Mm -hmm. studying modifications of RNA polymerase II on global gene expression. So from that experience, he was inspired to go to UC Berkeley, uh, where he got his PhD with Dave Savage, who's one of the senior authors on this paper, studying the biochemistry and physiology of these prokaryotic nanocompartments. And it was the day that he first collected the transmission electron micrographs of the purified protein complex and looked at them for the first time that he saw, in fact, they were nano compartments. And he said that was just a thrill. Hmm. He also tells a story that um, the way he ended up collaborating with his co-author, Ben LaFrance, is they were playing soccer together. They're <laughs> longtime friends. And he had to share this really exciting um, observation that he just made. And he thought, he, to- he, he told his, um, his friend, Ben LaFrance, he said, I think that we could really get some high resolution um, structures if we could hmm. take advantage of your expertise in cryo-EM that um, Ben was doing as a graduate student in um, Eva Nagalis's lab. So another senior author on this paper. And so um, Ben was was persuaded. Um, and Robert says it actually turned out to be a lot more work than he initially anticipated while they were playing soccer. <laughs> but he was real, <laughs> really appreciative. And he's especially thankful to his, um, his thesis hmm. advisor, um, nice. Dave Savage, who was really helpful and supportive. And he also has advice for junior scientists. And he says, you know, scientific outreach, sometimes it's you go into a classroom, you know, in grade school and you teach something, but he's um, taken it to another step. So he currently covers science news on a Philadelphia hip hop and news podcast called the okay. JXL podcast. And he's having an absolute blast. So he's kind of given back to his uh, region of uh, oh. Northeastern Philadelphia. So again, Ben LaFrance, he um, met him, our was playing soccer with him. That's how they got um, involved. That's how he pulled the uh, cryo EM specialist into the um, project. But how did um, Ben LaFrance get his start in science? His um, first job as a 14 year old was um, washing dishes at Montana State University in the dining hall, getting paid minimum mm-hmm. wage. And he was chatting with his neighbor about this, Trevor Douglas, who happened to be a biochemistry professor <laughs> at the college there. And his um, neighbor, Trevor Douglas, said, well, why don't you come wash dishes in my biochemistry lab instead? I'll even pay you a little bit more. <laughs> mm-hmm. And at the same time, um, Ben was taking a high school biology class from Paul Anderson, who he credits. He said he was a legendary ed- educator, and he actually was recognized as Montana's Teacher of the Year. So, um with this neighbor who said, come work and wash dishes in my lab, plus his high school uh, biology teacher, Paul Anderson, he got really excited and actually did quite a lot of uh, research as an undergraduate at Montana State. And in fact, he says he wants to people to realize they have a great track record of getting undergraduates into research labs. And certainly... Um, hmm. He had that experience. Ben was with um, Trevor Douglas for six years, and he co-authored five papers as an undergraduate with Trevor Douglas. And they were on the topics of exploring protein cages as multifunctional platforms. So we can see a thread there. 
So he then um, went to uh, Berkeley and decided he wanted to learn um, cryo EM to study these particles um, from a imaging angle. And so he did his um, PhD with Eva Nagolis. But he also wants to credit, um, in addition to his pal Rob, who really drove the project, um, he, they have a couple people in the Nagolis lab, um, Basil Gerber and um, Kelly Nagayan, who he said were really great scientists, but also just terrific lab citizens, always looking to help other people out in their projects. And they might not get authorship, but everybody knows that every lab has got people like that, and they really um, make, make the um, wheels turn. He also tells the story that the way they connected with um, Devin Radford, who was the bioinformatic uh, PhD student at University of Toronto, was they posted their manuscript on BioArchive, and they had cited um, De- Devin Radford's PhD thesis, and actually connected with him, had some conversations, and then were able to they were able to pull Devin Radford in to um, do more sophisticated analysis and and discussion about the bioinformatic um, aspect of their paper, which we didn't go into a lot of detail about. So he's um, putting in a plug for for the open platforms of of preprints and how that can also drive some collaborations. So when asked, like, was there a special, a really strong memory you have from this project and a really exciting day? And his, his attitude is that every day doing science has some level of excitement. It's like you're panning for gold. Nine times out of 10, there might be no gold. But 10 times out of 10, when you're panning, you're thinking, maybe, maybe this sample has got gold. Maybe this, I'm going to really hit it big. And he says, isn't that a part mm-hmm. of science? You have to look at that as a way to stay sane. You know, that excitement that you get, this might be the big one and I might make a big discovery. So I think that's a great, a great attitude. He also says for, for junior scientists, don't forget that the PH in PhD stands for Doctor of Philosophy. It's really important that you learn techniques, of course, but also how to approach the world, how to think scientifically. And that's something that he really appreciates about his experience. So after defending his thesis, um, he's waiting for his partner to finish her PhD. So he has been able, during this pandemic, to get get some positions studying amphibians in Yellowstone National Park. So he is currently a contractor scientist um, in the Black Rock Ranger District in Grand Teton National Park, studying amphibians and disease. And he also earlier had worked in Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. So um, he's really got a broad view um, as a doctor of philosophy would and um, is looking forward to what's next. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. I want to point out also that both papers are in eLife. How about right. that? The bread and the nanoparticles. Which means they're open access. They're open access. Yeah, the authors pay in advance to publish their work so that the readers don't have to pay. Which seems perverse. We shouldn't have to pay anything, but uh, that's how it is. Yeah. All right, let's do a couple of email. First from Alexander. I am Alexander, just a graduate student in Overcast Seattle, where it's currently 55F13C. In the latest TWIM240, Dr. Schechter mentioned there are no malaria vaccines outside of research settings. As I understand, that's not the case. As per the following link, the RTSS vaccine has gone through phase three trials, is approved in high malaria transmission areas in a number of African countries, and provides a link. Please correct me. If I am misunderstanding something, thank you for all your hard work. It looks like Michael did some research here, right? I did indeed. And the our listener is indeed correct. Um, there are at least three vaccines out there. The first two have undergone um, phase three trials. And in fact, the one that he mentions is um, uh, the subject of a Lancet article that I'll put into the show notes as well as a National Geographic article. And I'll also put that link in, in the show notes and the, the vaccines that are in, that are cited in the National Geographic and Lancet actually are better than the Mosquix vaccine that the listener actually mentioned. And it's because they are using uh, an adjuvant, and they point out in their narrative that these that this vaccine that's now available in Africa is safe and very immunogenic and shows 
promising high level efficiency. Um, Michael, was was this news just released? I feel like I heard about it just in the last couple of weeks, this excitement about the new malaria dr- uh, vaccine. Th- this actually just came out uh, three days ago. It was posted. So that's probably... I saw a lot of excitement on Twitter about the malaria yes. vac- new malaria vaccine. But for those of us in, in still at the bench level, there's also a nature paper um, that I suggested that Dixon and Daniel may want to cover on TWIP, but I'll, I'll post that in the show notes because that's also one of the uh, few papers in nature that seems to be open access as well. And their argument is they're trying to understand in the nature paper how the structure of the immunogen or the protein that's in the vaccine can make a good sterilizing vaccine because, of course, in malaria, you don't want to infect the hepatocyte. And hmm. finally, there's a third vaccine out there that still, as Ilio point, point probably was remembering, is still a research uh, opportunity. And that is the IV-based vaccine that's from Sonara um, out of Maryland. And they are about to go to manufacturing for their phase three trial in Africa in 2021. All right. Thank you, Michael. All right. One more from Dave. Hello, Twim. I was listening to episode 240 a few days ago. I thought it was interesting. As I listened, I thought, finally, I will see back reference of some work I was involved with. This was aspirin modulation of the colorectal cancer associated microbe fusobacterium. And Dave writes, this was not the case at all. When I looked at the subject of your last podcast, And he gives a couple of references that should have been pointed out by the reviewer to whether or not the authors of the MBio paper practice their work at UW Madison. And he provides two references to to similar work that's been done previously. One of my great regrets is not having been on top of my own insecurities enough to track down the question of why are the villi of the small intestine in mice non-existent in a notobiotic setting? Seems that the authors of this paper want to ignore the complexity of this interaction and also encourage kiddos to chase these host microbe interactions down. I know this is frustrating. As I was a kid and went for and spent a lot of time messing around with nucleic acid chemistry and diagnostics, so I didn't say anything back then, but the work was there and Brennan et al. chose to ignore this. I completely recognize that host microbe interactions are solid things to study, but what the heck, Dave? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's how so it goes he, sometimes. Is he referring to the snippet that you did, Michael, on aspirin modulation? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. I think so. But I I didn't have enough time to get into the microvillian. I think right. the, the, the notobiotic animals, since they are absent bacteria, and it's the bacteria interaction with the endothelial layer that I think actually causes those crypts to ultimately invaginate and in, in, in form. But again, I think more work needs to be done. But that's fascinating that the microbes impact the developmental biology of this of the host cells. Yeah. Yeah, Dave was just sad that he wasn't cited. Yeah, um, it happens. We've happens. all been there. It happens. By the way, <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't write the paper. We didn't write the paper. <laughs> no, no, we, he's not blaming us at all. By the way, in these notobiotic mice with aberrant villi, if you infect them with a murine norovirus, it partially restores the villus structure. Oh, no kidding. Because of the inflammation, probably. Oh. Who knows? Yep. Another complexity remaining to be studied. All right. On that note, we close TWIM242. You can find show notes, microbe.tv slash Twim, and you can send us questions and comments. If you want to complain, that's okay with us. Twim at microbe.tv. We, we can't do much, but we can we can commiserate. <laughs> that's right. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. My pleasure. Elio Schachter is at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure, too. Thank you. And Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. 
Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.